Kratom is a tropical evergreen tree found in Southeast Asia, particularly in countries like Thailand and Malaysia. It's scientifically known as Mitrigina speciosa and it's related to the coffee plant. People in Southeast Asia have traditionally used Kratom for various purposes, including treating conditions like diarrhea, cough and opium withdrawal. However, it's also been used recreationally and for boosting energy and productivity levels. The first documented scientific mentions of Kratom use date back to 1836 in today's Malaysia, where it was used as an opium substitute. Nowadays, Kratom is popular worldwide, including countries like the Czech Republic. In this video, we'll cover the essential aspects of Kratom, including its chemistry, mechanism of action, administration methods, dosing, effects, withdrawal, potential risks when combined with other drugs and signs of overdose. It's worth noting that Kratom contains around 40 different alkaloids, most of which aren't pharmacologically active. Therefore, we will focus on the most abundant and active alkaloids, namely mitragynine, which makes up 66% of Kratom's overall alkaloid content, along with its primary active metabolite 7 hydroxymitragynine also known as 7-OH mitragynine, which is also present in Kratom itself, albeit in insignificant quantities. So now, without any further ado, let's dive into the basic chemistry of mitragynine and 7-OH mitragynine. Mitragynine is a compound that acts as a central nervous system stimulant and depressant, specifically as an atypical opioid. It belongs to the indole alkaloid family and has the formula C23, H30 and 2O4, signifying 23 carbon atoms, 30 hydrogen atoms, 2 nitrogen atoms and 4 oxygen atoms in its structure. Its molar mass is 398.5 grams per mole and it boasts four optical stereoisomers. Furthermore, its boiling point hits 235 degrees Celsius under 0.00658 atmospheres of pressure, and in its free base form, it has the presence of white amorphous crystals. In such a form, mitragynine is exclusively soluble in organic solvents like acetone and alcohol. I should also briefly add that various kratom strains contain different levels of mitragynine and 7-OH mitragynine and two other chemically related pharmacologically active alcohols. Alkaloids, namely species silatine and corinathiadine. These variations can lead to significant differences in psychophysiological effects, even with identical doses of different strains. This is also depicted on the chart on the right side under the mitragynine's molecular structure. In any case, bear in mind that the chart is just orientational and should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt as the Kratom's effect are also modulated significantly by individual differences of users. So now, let's delve into 7-hydroxymitragynine, a compound that shares some intriguing qualities with mitragynine. Likewise to mitragynine, 7-hydroxymitragynine can act as both a CNS stimulant and an atypical opioid, depending on the dosage. It too belongs to the indole alkaloid chemical class and its chemical formula is C23H30 and 2O5, with a molar mass of 414.5 grams per mole. Unlike mitragynine, 7-hydroxymitragynine has only two optical stereoisomers, adding a touch of simplicity to its complexity. This compound boasts a notably high boiling point, standing at 567.4 degrees Celsius, with a slight deviation of plus or minus 50 degrees Celsius under the pressure of one atmosphere. And just like mitragynine, the free base form of 7-hydroxymitragynine presents as white amorphous crystals and can only be dissolved in organic solvents. With 7-hydroxymitragynine, we find another compound that exhibits fascinating properties, making it an essential piece of the Kratom puzzle. So now, let's continue our exploration with another chapter discussing Kratom's mechanism of action. Kratom's pharmacological profile is notably complex and currently not well understood. In addition, there is a substantial lack of human research, thus most of the findings come from animal studies. Nevertheless, the current evidence indicates that both mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine interact with a fascinating array of receptors and channels in the brain, including opioid receptors, dopaminergic receptors, adrenergic receptors, serotonergic receptors, glutamatergic receptors, adenosine receptors and sodium channels. 
I should also briefly discuss the proposed mechanism by which metragonin interacts with more opioid receptors, as this appears to be its key site of action. So, current research suggests that metragonin acts as a so-called biased agonist of this receptor, preferring the activation of the G-protein pathway over the better arrested one, potentially leading to fewer side effects like constipation and respiratory depression when compared to traditional opiates like morphine. Due to such mechanism of action, metragonin is currently being researched as a safer analgesic with fewer side effects than classical opiates and opioids. However, it should be noted that some contradicting evidence suggests that metragonin acts as a partial agonist of more receptors, with some studies even suggesting it acts as a full agonist with no biased agonistic action. More recently, Gillis and others indicated that the reduced side effects of biased more agonists, like metragonin, may stem from their lower intrinsic efficacy at more receptors as opposed to their preference for activating the G-protein pathway. This means that, unlike morphine, metragonin might not produce a maximum functional biological response upon attaching to the more receptor, leading to the production of some, but not all, effects associated with more activation. Be that as it may, most contemporary research seems to classify metragonin as a biased more agonist, whereas 7 hydroxymetragonin is most commonly classified as a partial more agonist. Nevertheless, as mentioned, both substances also interact with receptors of additional brain pathways, which is why they possess stimulatory and antidepressant-like effects. Hence, that is why they are both classified as atypical opioids. Now let's delve into the overall pharmacological profile of metragonin and 7-hydroxymetragonin. So as previously mentioned, metragonin is believed to function as either a partial, full or biased agonist of more opioid receptors. When it comes to the door and core opioid receptors, research suggests that it acts as a weak competitive agonist for these receptors. In the context of the dopaminergic system, research postulates that metragonin acts as an agonist for both D1 and D2 dopaminergic receptors. In addition to its interaction with the opioid and dopaminergic systems and their respective receptors, metragonin also exhibits an affinity for certain adrenergic receptors. It functions as a partial agonist of alpha-1A and D receptors and agonist of alpha-2A adrenergic receptors. Within the serotonergic system, Metragonin appears to operate as a competitive antagonist for 5-HD2A receptors and antagonist for 5-HD2C and 5-HD7 serotonergic receptors. Lastly, metragonin shows some affinity for A2 adenosine receptors. However, current research has yet to determine its specific action in this context. Turning our attention to the pharmacological profile of 7-hydroxymetragonin, where it appears to function as a partial agonist of more opioid receptors and a weak antagonist of door and core opioid receptors. In the dopaminergic system, 7-hydroxymetragonin interacts with both D1 and D2 dopaminergic receptors, with research suggesting its potential agonistic activity towards these receptors. Furthermore, recent research has indicated that 7-hydroxymetragonin may have an affinity for alpha-2A adrenergic receptors though its precise action remains unknown. Nevertheless, some other contemporary studies postulate that this compound lacks affinity for adrenergic receptors altogether. Regarding the serotonin system, it seems that 7-hydroxymetragonin may act as an agonist for 5-HD2A receptors. Nevertheless, conflicting evidence suggests that it may have no affinity for serotonergic receptors, implying no pharmacological activity in this domain. Lastly, in the adenosine system, 7-hydroxymetragonin exhibits no discernible pharmacological activity. Alright, let's look at metragonines and 7-hydroxymetragonines pharmacokinetics profiles. So the metragonines oral bioavailability ranges from 21 to 44 percent. It takes between 0.8 to 1.5 hours to reach its peak plasma concentration, Dmax for short. And the biological half-life of metragonine varies between 3 to 9 hours. 
Furthermore, mitragynin has a high protein binding profile with around 85-95% to binding. This means that a significant portion of absorbed mitragynin remains bound to blood plasma proteins, limiting its access to the central nervous system. This binding also affects its metabolism, as mitragynin bound to blood plasma proteins cannot be metabolized until it dissociates. The terminal half-life, which signifies the time for the 50% of the drug to be removed from the blood plasma during the terminal elimination phase ranges from 23 to 45 hours. As for the 7-hydroxymitragynine, its oral bioavailability falls within a similar range to mitragynine, which is approximately 20 to 40 percent. The Tmax for 7-hydroxymitragynine is between 0.75 to 2.5 hours and it also exhibits high protein binding at about 80 percent. The biological half-life of 7-hydroxymitragynine ranges from 5 to 6.5 5 hours and the terminal half-life stands at approximately 23 hours with a deviation of plus or minus 16 hours. Now let's look at a graph illustrating the plasma concentration time profiles of mitragynine, 7-hydroxymitragynine and some mitragynine diastereomers. So, as depicted, all these compounds maintain a relatively long-lasting presence in human blood plasma following oral kratom administration and thus can still be detected in the blood even after 24 hours. Okay, now let's dive into the metabolism of kratom. Like with most other drugs that we've discussed on this channel, the alkaloids in kratom, including mitragynine, undergo primary metabolism in the liver, facilitated by the enzyme complex known as cytochrome B450. The primary enzymes involved in this metabolic conversion are CYP3A4, CYP2D6, CYP2C9, CYP2C18, and CYP2C19. Additionally, it's worth noting that a small portion of mitragynine and other alkaloids is being metabolized by the CYP3A4 enzyme in the intestine. As mentioned earlier, mitragynine is transformed into a more potent metabolite 7 hydroxymitragynine with CYP3A4 playing the most significant role in this process. However, additional enzymes including CYP2D6 and CYP2C9 also contribute to the metabolism of mitragynine to a lesser extent. Interestingly, 7 hydroxymitragynine undergoes further metabolism in the blood, forming an even more potent typical opioid called mitragynine pseudoindoxyl. This transformation likely contributes to the overall psychophysiological effects produced by Kratom, although the extent of this contribution remains uncertain. What's particularly intriguing is that this metabolic conversion appears to occur exclusively in humans and hasn't been observed in other species. Right, now let's break down the metabolic process of mitragynine and related alkaloids. So in the first phase, Mitragynine undergoes hydrolysis and O-demethylation of OCH3 groups, as illustrated in the picture on the right. Subsequently, these alkaloids, including mitragynine, undergo oxidation and reduction. The first phase results in the creation of metabolites, most of which are not pharmacologically active. However, as mentioned earlier, there are two key active metabolites, 7 hydroxymitragynine and mitragynine pseudoindoxyl. Moving on to the second phase of metabolism, where remaining metabolites undergo conjugation reaction involving glucuronidation and sulfonation. These reactions predominantly produce water soluble pharmacologically inactive metabolites that can be excreted in the urine. To sum up, the most abundant metabolites found in human urine after ingesting kratom include 7 hydroxymitragynine, 5 desmethylmitragynine, and 17 desmethylhydromitragynine. Now that we've explored Kratom's metabolism, let's briefly examine its potential metabolic interaction with other substances that are metabolized by the same enzymes. However, before we delve into this topic, it's essential to note that the following information is derived from animal studies, in vivo experiments and preclinical research, as comprehensive human studies are lacking. Therefore, take this information with caution. So, according to current research, 
Mitragynin may inhibit the activity of CYP2D19 and CYP2D6 enzymes, resulting in a slower clearance of substances metabolized by these enzymes. This inhibition could increase the risk of overdose when kratom is combined with other substances that share these metabolic pathways. Interestingly, one study suggested that as little as 9 grams of kratom powder containing 83 milligrams of mitragynin might inhibit the activity of these enzymes. Furthermore, mitragynin's main active metabolite, 7 hydroxymitragynin appears to act as an irreversible time-dependent inhibitor of CYP3A4, an enzyme responsible for metabolizing approximately 40% of all clinically used substances. This unique enzymatic inhibition leads to the complete inactivation of CYP3A4 by altering its structure, which effectively renders it ineffective for further metabolic processes. However, it's important to note that not all CYP3A4 enzymes in the body are affected by this, and the magnitude of this effect may be dose-dependent. In other words, higher doses of kratom may deactivate more of these enzymes. Additionally, as depicted on the diagram, lower doses of kratom tend to block intestinal CYP3A4 enzymes, potentially increasing the bioavailability of some compounds. On the other hand, Higher doses are responsible for hepatic CYP2D6 and CYP3A4 inhibition. In any case, once CYP3A4 is blocked by 7 hydroxymitragynin the body needs some time to resynthesize this enzyme, which can take up to 3 days. Regarding the amount of kratom required to cause CYP3A4 inhibition, as little as 2 grams of kratom powder containing 21 mg of mitragynin can have this effect. Therefore, Exercise extra caution when mixing kratom with other drugs, as just 2 grams of powder can lead to a drug-to-drug -drug metabolic interaction. Specifically, you should avoid combining kratom with other CYP2D6 and CYP3A4 inhibitors such as amphetamines, including regular amphetamine, methamphetamine and MDMA. Additional categories of drugs that shouldn't be mixed with kratom include opiates and opioids, certain antidepressants and antipsychotics, benzodiazepines like Valium and antiviral agents like HIV medicine Ritonavir. Now let's take a quick look at the various routes of kratom administration. The most popular and safest method is definitely oral consumption, where you have several options. These include placing the kratom powder in your mouth and washing it down with water, brewing kratom tea or simply ingesting kratom capsules. Overall, this mode of administration offers the highest bioavailability compared to other methods. Although not so common, another option for kratom administration is intranasal usage, and the reports of this method come from users in Thailand and Malaysia. In any case, it's advisable to avoid this method due to its low bioavailability, necessitating high doses for desired effects. Additionally, frequent use of intranasal kratom can lead to nasal damage or infection, making it an inconvenient and potentially risky choice. Lastly, some users in Malaysia have experimented with smoking kratom in combination with tobacco. This method is undoubtedly the riskiest and least efficient. Similar to intranasal use, it offers low bioavailability, requiring high kratom doses for effects. Moreover, the heat from smoking may destroy some alkaloids such as metragonin, further necessitating increased doses. Understandably, long-term use of this method carries additional health risks, including the potential development of cancer and chronic pulmonary obstruction disease. Hence, avoiding this method entirely due to its potential dangers is strongly advised. Now, let's explore kratom dosing in non-tolerant individuals. However, please note that the dosing information presented here is based on user reports from Psychonaut Wiki and Arrowit. Hence, the dosing is orientational and should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. Also, it's essential to understand that the optimal dose can vary significantly in practice due to factors such as specific strain of kratom, individual tolerance, personal neurochemistry, metabolism and other factors. Also, I'll focus exclusively on the dosing of premium kratom powder as this version is more popular and widespread in my home country, the Czech Republic. Hence, if you're interested in learning about the dosing of kratom powder with added alkaloid extract, you can pause the video and explore that separately. So the threshold dose is between 2 to 4 grams, 
A light dose corresponds to a range of 4 to 6 grams, a common dose lies between 6 to 10 grams, and a strong dose equates to a range of 10 to 15 grams. When it comes to the time frame of Kratom's effects, here's what you can generally expect. The initial come up usually takes between 5 to 20 minutes. On the other hand, the peak effects may last from 1 to 5 hours, after which you may experience residual effects that can linger for anywhere between 1 to 6 hours. Anyway, please keep in mind that these time frames are approximate and based on individual user reports. The actual duration of Kratom's effects can vary significantly from person to person. Now, we have finally come to the psychological effects of Kratom, which are highly dose-dependent. That is because the lower doses typically yield mental stimulation and a sense of mental clarity, while higher doses often induce mental sedation characterized by opiate-like euphoria. However, it's important to note that this euphoria is nowhere near as intense as what you might experience with standard opiates and opioids, like morphine or tramadol especially when taken intravenously. However, some aerobic user reports suggest that using kratom powder with added alkaloid extract in higher doses may produce a euphoric response comparable to taking 20 mg of hydrocodone, also known as Vicodin. Nevertheless, it's crucial to understand that psychological effects can vary significantly between individuals due to numerous factors as previously mentioned. So the positive psychological effects associated with Kratom use may include a sense of euphoria, anxiety suppression, mental stimulation, improved concentration, increased motivation, improved attention, increased alertness, social disinhibition, and suppression of psychological opiate and opioid withdrawal. On the neutral side, Kratom use may lead to thought acceleration, albeit less dramatic compared to classical stimulants like amphetamine. Additional neutral effects include mental sedation, sleepiness, and vivid dreams. Conversely, negative effects may include compulsive dosing, cravings, ego inflation, irritability, and psychological depletion. When it comes to the physiological effects of Kratom, they again vary depending on the dosage. Lower doses tend to produce physical stimulation associated with a sympathetic reaction, inducing increased heart rate and blood pressure. On the other hand, higher doses typically result in physical sedation characterized by decreased cardiac output and potential muscle relaxation. In summary then, the positive physiological effects of Kratom may include physical stimulation or sedation, physical euphoria characterized by muscle relaxation and warm bodily feeling, analgesia, cough suppression and physical opiate and opioid withdrawal suppression. Neutral effects then include pupil constriction, increased perspiration, urinary retention, appetite suppression, body odor alteration, and muscle relaxation. On the flip side, negative physiological effects can include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, stomach cramps, body itching, skin rash, constipation, dizziness, muscle tremors, orgasm suppression, and temporary erectile dysfunction. Also, remember that these effects can vary from person to person due to numerous discussed factors. While not very common, high to strong doses of Kratom in individuals with lower tolerance may produce a range of visual effects. These effects may include blurred or double vision and reduced visual acuity. Of particular note are internal visual hallucinations characterized by hypnagogic patterns typically repetitive and fixed in their style lacking the complexity of the internal hallucinations produced by classical psychedelics like LSD. It's important to mention that the intensity of these hallucinations may increase when combining kratom with other substances, particularly cannabinoids, psychedelics and dissociatives. In addition to the visual effects, High to strong kratom doses may induce a mild sense of dissociation. This sensation is characterized by a subtle feeling of disconnection from the surrounding world and is somewhat akin to the dissociative effects produced by substances like ketamine, although generally less intense. The pharmacological activity of rincophylline, a known NMDA antagonist, is thought to mediate this effect. 
Alright, now let's peek at the neurobiological mechanisms underpinning the development of psychological and physiological addiction and withdrawal on Kratom. Nevertheless, before we can proceed, it's important to note that this section is based mainly on my assumptions due to limited research on this topic. Drawing from our knowledge of addiction and withdrawal from other opioids, we can assume that similar mechanism might apply to Kratom. With that in mind, Let's briefly explore the potential neurobiological mechanisms of Kratom addiction and withdrawal, starting with the development of psychological addiction. Like other opioids, Kratom activates more opioid receptors, resulting in a sudden decrease in GABA activity. This in turn leads to increased dopaminergic activity. Furthermore, Prolonged, continuous kratom abuse can sustain this heightened dopaminergic activity, resulting in increased delta FSOB protein induction within the nucleus accumbens's dopaminergic neurons. Consequently, the brain undergoes structural and corresponding functional alterations and adapts to ongoing kratom use. Furthermore, various other brain pathways, including noradrenergic, serotoninergic, glutamatergic, and cholinergic, abbreviated as N. S, G and CH on the slide may also become dysregulated. This dysregulation could potentially contribute to further alterations in the brain's functioning. Lastly, animal models have shown cross-sensitization between kratom and other opiates and opioids, suggesting a shared neurobiological pathway in the development of psychological addiction. Regarding physiological addiction to kratom, it appears to operate through mechanisms similar to those found with other opioids. In this case, Kratom activates more opiate receptors, suppressing noradrenergic activity in the locus coeruleus, a key brain's noradrenergic center. When a Kratom user stops their intake, the locus coeruleus suddenly becomes hyperactive, leading to a sharp increase in noradrenaline levels throughout the brain and body. This sudden surge in noradrenaline levels contributes to the emergence of various psychophysiological symptoms, including anxiety, elevated heart rate, and increased blood pressure. Additionally, long-term kratom abuse likely leads to the downregulation of more opiate receptors and upregulation of core opiate receptors. The increased number of core opiate receptors makes the brain more susceptible to denorphin activity, resulting in decreased dopaminergic transmission. Moreover, heightened core receptor activation by denorphins triggers the release of corticotropin-releasing factor hormone, CRF for short, amplifying the hypothalamic pituitary axis activity, or HBAA for short. This further exacerbates symptoms of physiological addiction manifesting by physical withdrawal after abrupt discontinuation of kratom use. Psychological withdrawal from kratom appears to share similarities with other drugs as it's regulated by the adaptation and desensitization of the dopaminergic system. This means that over time the brain becomes accustomed to the increased dopamine levels caused by kratom use. Additionally, a decrease in D2 receptors availability likely aids this adaptation. These changes result in a lower level of dopamine in the dopaminergic pathway, contributing to a hypodopaminergic state. Opioid dysregulation, particularly the upregulation of core opiate receptors and increased denorphin activity, also plays a role in reducing dopamine levels. Furthermore, the glutamatergic pathway becomes hypersensitive to environmental cues associated with kratom use. When exposed to these cues, there's a sudden spike in glutamatergic activity, intensifying cravings during abstinence. Additional neurobiological adaptations involve the dysregulation of the noradrenergic system, which becomes highly active after quitting kratom. Potential pathological dysregulations in the serotonergic and cholinergic systems also seem to be involved, further worsening psychological withdrawal symptoms like mood changes and an obsession with kratom seeking. Lastly, similarly to the mechanism of physiological addiction, increased CRF levels causing HBAA hyperactivity further aggravate the overall severity of psychological withdrawal symptoms which may include anxiety and irritability. When it comes to the mechanism of physiological withdrawal development, it shares similarities with physiological addiction, which kind of makes sense because withdrawal is the primary symptom 
symptom of physiological addiction. And here it begins with the activation of more opioid receptors due to the pharmacological action of mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine. This action leads to a decrease in noradrenergic release in the locus coralius brain region, whereby after abruptly stopping kratom use, the noradrenergic pathway becomes hyperactive, causing an uncontrolled release of noradrenaline in the locus coralius, resulting in a hyperactive noradrenergic state. Furthermore, additional systematic dysregulations contribute to the manifestation of physiological withdrawal symptoms. These may involve neuropeptide dysregulation, notably an increase in substance P activity, contributing to muscle pain during initial periods of abstinence. Kratom withdrawal symptoms typically emerge within 12 to 48 hours after stopping its use. This delay is due to the relatively long biological half-life of mitragynine and 7-hydroxymitragynine. Now let's briefly discuss how long these symptoms can last. So the physical symptoms typically stick around for about 1 to 3 days. However, the mental symptoms like anxiety can persist for up to a week or longer. And when it comes to cravings, they can hang around for weeks, months or in rare cases even years. If we would compare Kratom withdrawal to a withdrawal from let's say more hardcore drugs like morphine, it's generally considered less intense. Hence, it's often categorized as mild to moderate. Additionally, there's no official diagnosis for Kratom use disorder. So there's no one-size-fits-all treatment plan for Kratom addiction and withdrawal. However, based on what we know from limited research on this topic, a combination of opioid substitution therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy seems to help the most with more severe Kratom withdrawals. Therefore, this again suggests that there might be some similarities between Kratom and opioid addiction and withdrawal. Now, let's dive into the symptoms. Kratom withdrawal can bring about psychological symptoms like cravings, difficulty concentrating, loss of motivation, anxiety, restlessness, irritability, anger, apathy, lethargy, sadness, insomnia, and in rare instances, depression, psychosis, confusion, and delusions. On the physical side, you might experience muscle and joint pain, excessive tearing, a runny nose, yawing, fevers, muscle tremors, decreased appetite, itching, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, and bloating. Alright, let's briefly talk about potential interactions between Kratom and other substances when used concurrently. First off, there are certain categories of drugs that should definitely be avoided when using Kratom. These include stimulants, empathogens and tactogens, depressants, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and psychedelics. Combining Kratom with any of these can lead to metabolic interaction and potentially result in an overdose involving Kratom and the other substance or substances. On the flip side, there are some substances that tend to be relatively safe when combined with Kratom. These include caffeine, nicotine and cannabinoids. However, it's worth noting that some cannabinoids found in cannabis like THC and CBD might inhibit the activity of CYP3A4 and CYP2D6 enzymes, which can affect Kratom metabolism by reducing the conversion of mitragynine to 7-hydroxymitragynine, mainly when the cannabis is used before ingesting Kratom. Now, when it comes to combining Kratom with caffeine and nicotine, there seems to be a synergetic stimulatory effect. This combination might slightly increase blood pressure, but importantly, there are no reported cases of adverse interactions with fatal consequences. That said, it's important to realize that the long-term effects of using Kratom alongside caffeine or nicotine haven't been extensively studied. Hence, in the spirit of harm reduction, the safest approach is to avoid mixing Kratom with other substances altogether. So, this is the final section of this video where we will briefly look at the symptoms of a Kratom overdose. Let's start with the psychological signs, which can include lethargy, agitation, mental dullness, drowsiness, and a reduction in cognitive capabilities. On the other hand, physiological symptoms of Kratom overdose include hypertension, tachycardia, constipation, nausea, vomiting, and muscle tremors. That pretty much wraps up our discussion for today, and in the next video, I'll be analyzing methamphetamine in a similar format, so stay tuned.
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and give that like button a smash. And if you have any questions about Kratom or any other drugs, feel free to drop a comment into the comment section below. Also, if you'd be interested, you can visit the drug library portal using the link below, where you can find a long promised detailed analysis on amphetamine in addition to the articles discussing ketamine and cannabis.